This is part three on a subject entitled gambling. Should a Christian participate? Uh, we started off uh, the last time in part one looking at three ways to approach life. Prospect, retrospect, or reject. Now, it is our contention that Jesus Christ gives us the example of prospect. He always learned and then lived. He never had a past. He never learned from his mistakes. He never made them. He could not be encumbered with ignorance. Uh, and so therefore, he had to know what to do in every situation, and that's how he lived. He lived in the light of what he learned prior to, the, to that instant. Um, so therefore, that's how we're to learn. But uh, the sad fact is, when we're born, we're born condemned with an old sin nature. And uh, therefore, we all have a past. We all live and learn. But once we become Christians and we look back on our lives, the important thing is now is to live in prospect and not retrospect. Yes, we've lived and learned. We've made our mistakes. But now that we're believers, we want to live like Christ. How does he live? How did he live, rather? He lived in prospect. He lived in the light of learning first and then living. Now, there is a third thing that you can do. You can reject it altogether. There is a warning in uh, the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs and other places, uh, John 3, of not coming to the light. In fact, that's the condemnation, the book of John tells us. Uh, they saw the light, they understood God, they knew Him, but they didn't want to keep the light, or the understanding of God in their minds. And so therefore, those who don't come to the light of God's Word are those who, who stand condemned. Now, it is your option. You can either live in prospect. And by the way, that's what we're doing here. Now that you are a Christian, prospect is what you're supposed to be doing. Being at a place that teaches the Word of God so that you can learn. Once you learn it, then you live in its light. If not, you're going to spend the rest of your life living in retrospect. I want to serve the Lord, but I didn't learn how to do it. I failed here. I'm going to try to do better. Now, the trying to do better means that you failed. You were unsuccessful in your Christian experience. Or you can reject it altogether and come under the judging hand of God. Now, such is the way of those who do not learn God's lessons with regard to various issues in life. For example, the subject at hand, gambling. God calls, in the book of Proverbs, the prosperity that comes from this type of endeavor, the prosperity of fools. We went uh, into great length indicating what that prosperity was and uh, what a foolish person is and how it can destroy them. The way it destroys them is, is seen in the very definition of prosperity. It is the word Shabbat in the Hebrew, and it means the type of prosperity that makes you a little bit lazy with regard to spiritual things. I've got money in the bank. I don't need God. I've got external material security. And so therefore, uh, why do I need God? Now, if you lose everything, you know, the first thing you do, oh God, the stock market just fell. Oh God, I just wagered everything and it's gone. Oh God, get me out of this mess. And you know what God says? He'll laugh at you when your calamity comes. You laugh at wisdom, he's go it's going to laugh at you when you lose everything through wagering. Uh, so it is the type of prosperity that lulls you to spiritual complacency. Should not do it, therefore. All right. That brought us then to the three-part definition of gambling. Always in our studies we have Bible definitions. These are important because you cannot comprehend what we're even talking about if you don't, if you cannot define it clearly, specifically. So the three parts of gambling. First of all, it is risking either money or materials or both. 
You know, some people have put down their life savings and then say, well, here, here is my house and property, you know. Here are the kids' shoes. I'm going to bet it all on the turn of a card, the toss of the dice. So gambling, what we're talking about is staking money or materials on one's prediction of a more or less unpredictable outcome of a future event. You don't know what that card's going to be, but you are staking this money that it's going to be an ace, it's going to be a king, it's going to be the right one that's going to give you the upper hand in the deal. Uh, it's going to be this as far as the turn of the dice, or whatever you're doing in the, in the gaming thing. You are predicting a future event to turn in your favor. Secondly, it involves forecasting or foretelling. We could call it fortune telling. So that's exactly what it is. When you gamble, you're fortune telling. You are telling yourself that you were able to see into the future and, and or to manipulate your future in your favor. And we'll take a look at that more today. So that you can see a final combination or a final state with regard to a certain conclusion. Um, again, this card is going to turn up, this number is going to turn up, and the dice on the wheel, whatever. Uh, the turn of the one-armed bandits, you're going to get three lemons or three cherries or whatever it is, you know, across there. But you're predicting a future event. Now, of course, the more random uh, the, the numbers, uh, the odds, then of course the more you're risking by way of losing, the, the greater the risk you're taking. The third definition, or third part of the definition of gambling is this. Why do people gamble? Now you perhaps have never considered this before. Why am I here? Why am I playing these cards? Why am I throwing these dice? Why am I spinning the wheel of fortune? You're doing it hoping something. Now mind you, it's our contention that you as a believer should not hope this. That's why, as we will see, gambling for the most part is wrong. What are you hoping when you gamble? You are hoping to gain fortune at another's loss or misfortune. I hope I win, but I hope you lose, you see. And you cannot be looking out for the welfare of another. You cannot be acting toward them in Christian love, hoping that they lose their shirt, the seat of their pants, their children's shoes, the next house payment at, at, your, at your good fortune. You can't do it. And, and still be in the center of the will of God. If you're in the center of the will of God, you are going to be concerned about their well-being uh, with regard to time and eternity. So that's what gambling is. It is hoping that you'll win and have good fortune at the misfortune of another. Now, with regard to that, we have some Bible responses. First of all, with regard to the first part of this definition, of staking money. The Word of God tells us that you are, not to, uh, you are not allowed to have unauthorized risks. Remember, the devil took the Lord up to the temple and he said, jump off. And he quoted a verse of scripture. <laughs> and Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Yes, if God tells me to go through this wilderness to the promised land and there are dangers and risks, that verse applies to that. He told me to do it, but he didn't tell me to jump off this 450 foot uh, <laughs> temple wall down to the Valley of Kedron below. He didn't tell me to do that. I'm at my own risk and it's unauthorized. Now, if God tells me jump, I'll jump, but don't tempt the Lord your God. Now, here is the application for you. God has provided through grace money for you to live. And you say, God, I'm going to take this money and wager it all, and you lost it. And then you say, well, God, you're going to have to provide more to consume it upon my lusts. Uh, I lost it all, but God, you better give me some more to live on. 
Now, that's an unauthorized risk. That's tempting God. And you're not allowed to do that as, as a Christian. Secondly, uh, the second aspect uh, of gambling is fortune telling. Foreseeing the future, manipulating it in your favor. You know what that's called in the Bible? Divination. Now we're going to look in just a little bit at enchantment. You've always heard <laughs> they live a charm life. They go to the gaming tables and uh, they always seem to win. Well, they might, might have a little more help than what you might suspect. We just learned about the crystals and why people have crystals. To send light their way, favor their way, prosperity their way. Yeah, that's right. Divining means that you're either acting as God or you're depending on one who does. To control the future in your favor to win. Now, we noted last time that there are two means of divination, the mechanical kind and the inspirational kind. The mechanical kind says, here are the odds, uh, here's the way it's going to go, here's how you should bet, and it depends upon your own insight as to what you should wager and upon whom or what. The inspirational kind means that you have now inner intuition, a hunch, but there's a problem with that. Most hunches with this regard are demon influences in your life. You see, a person who is a Christian doesn't live by their hunches. You live by the facts represented in the Word of God and faith in believing them, that God's going to meet your needs, not fate. And so, therefore, you can't use divination of any sort in order to control the future. And, by the way, that, that means, and here's, here's uh, what we said the last time. The Bible condemns Balaam for taking the rewards of divination. Now, what was he going to do? God blessed Israel, and Balaam was paid to curse Israel. Now, that is what you are doing in divination. You are asking yourself or some god, some demon, some force out there to curse one who's blessed or, or what have you, or to bless yourself who's cursed. You're, you're out of God's will, but it doesn't matter. You're trying to prosper yourself ahead of God's system. That's what divination is. If you win, that's the rewards of divination. Balaam was killed physically for divination, for gambling that he could curse the people who were already blessed. Now, um, two things about this as a believer with regard to divination. If you act on a tip, well, we're all... Uh, here and all of a sudden we've got this great tip. This team's going to win. This, this horse is going to win. But nobody else has it and they all bet their money on the standard randomness of the outcome. But you have an edge and no one else knows. So you put your money and the rest of them bet on the randomness. Do you know that's cheating? You have an edge that puts you to a greater advantage. You have stacked the odds of the future in your favor, and you have not told everybody else. So you're not on an equal playing field. As a believer, you have to provide things honest in the sight of all men. If you're going to gamble, at least you better do it honestly. If you get a good tip that, that puts you ahead of everybody else, that is cheating. That's ill-gotten gain. Secondly, say someone has given you a tip but they're lying, you know, sea biscuit and the fourth. You act on that. You have based your life on a lie. Your future is, is now contingent on a lie, which means you're going to fail to begin with. You failed when you believed a lie. And of course, that's, that's Lucifer's way of going about things. He, he'll tell you a lie and he expects you to believe it. And that, of course, is what is being done at this matter of gambling. Now, there is a third thing with regard to this. We said that part of the definition of gambling is hoping to get fortune on somebody else's misfortune. Well, you say, Pastor, what is the problem with that much? Coveting means to wrongfully desire the property of another without due regards to their rights. 
So, the Ten Commandments, the very last commandment says, thou shalt not what? Covet. But you're not going to work for the money, which is God's way, but you desire to have someone else's possessions. The desire to have their possessions in an inordinate fashion, apart from the regular system of business, is coveting. So therefore, um, most all gambling is based upon greed. You, you simply can't get around it. You are wanting the material possessions of somebody else without working for it and allowing them to buy it. You're making a profit off of your skill or, or uh, bona fide labor. So, uh, the Bible, one of the Ten Commandments, when you go to these gaming tables, you just remember that you're wanting that person's possessions without doing the work to get it. Now, in a regular exchange of monies for business and making a profit, there's nothing wrong with that. That's sanctioned in Scripture. But saying, I want it at risk, I'm hoping you lose, is the wrong desire to approach the life anyway. All right. Now, we went here. Here's where we're going to end our review and get into some new material. Why not gamble? It's coveting. Coveting is the foremost manifestation of the old sin nature. It is commandment 10, and it says, Thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. And Paul said, I had not known sin. That is the basic characteristic of the old sin nature. Romans 7, 7. Had the law uh, not said, thou shalt not covet. I wouldn't have understood what I'm doing uh, here with this matter of envy and jealousy and desiring others, uh, another's property. So, Romans 7, 7, we understand that coveting is the most basic manifestation of the old sin nature. The spirit within us lusts to envy. That's what the scripture says. We want what somebody else has. Well, I wish I had that. They don't deserve that. Flip of a car, boom, I, I win your possession. That's old sin nature. Secondly, Paul summarizes the law and he says, Thou shalt not covet. And then he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You want to do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Do you want them to lust or covet or desire your possessions and take away from you what you've worked for, what belongs to you and your family? Uh, uh, mortgaging the future of your kids on the turn of a card, on the throw of a dock? No, 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 sir. It's contrary to Christian love. You're not concerned about the other guy. You're more concerned about yourself when you take this kind of risk. Now we're in Ephesians chapter 5 and we're going to enter into some new material here. This is one of the strongest, perhaps most stinging of all the rebukes that we've had thus far, though many of them are uh, very serious, with regard to why a Christian doesn't gamble. The Apostle Paul, in two different places, calls coveting idolatry. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, unclean person, covetous man, now know what follows, who is an idolater. See, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The last commandment is, Thou shalt not covet. So, if you covet, you have another God. You're not only breaking commandment 10, you're breaking commandment 1. There's another God. And all, all the way down you can go with regard to this issue of coveting. He has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now note that. You might get the other man's inheritance by means of gambling. But mark it down. <laughs> the prosperity of fools shall destroy you. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and you have no inheritance in the future kingdom. Yeah, you might have had great rewards here, but it's the reward of divination. It's a prosperity of fools. So that's why the Apostle Paul calls coveting idolatry. All right, now let's go to Colossians chapter 3.
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. This is speaking to the Christian. And please remember, that's what we're doing here. We're saying why a Christian shouldn't participate uh, in this fashion. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. Now note again, in another letter, he adds this to coveting, which is idolatry. And he also adds this in Ephesians, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in which he also walked some time when you lived in them, but now put off all these, put off coveting, and so forth. Now, why not gamble? Because coveting is idolatry. It's mammon worship. The Greek word is idololatres. Now, uh, idolatry is uh, tria at the end, but uh, this is referring to an idolater. There's an interesting thing about this. Uh, it is a word that goes all the way back. It is the Greek word for explaining idolaters all the way back to those in uh, the land of Canaan, even before that. It's one who eats the flesh of a victim sacrificed to the devil. Now, some were not cannibals, of course. They sacrificed their children and didn't eat them. But most would sacrifice various animals and eat the flesh. And so this particular word came to be known for those who ate the substance of victims. The regular Greek word for an idol is icon. It means you can go to the idol and you can and put it, tap it right on the head, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's hard and fast. That's what an icon is. It's fashioned in a, in a certain way. But uh, it is a material thing that can be touched. But an idolon was something that could be seen in an apparition. It was something that was worshipped and could be seen, but it had no what? Substance to it. And that's the point here. That's what an idolater is. You're looking at someone and you're saying, I want to devour your substance. I can see you, but I see you only in an apparition because the substance is gone. Now that's very, very serious to be a coveter. Uh, uh, it means to uh, literally go to the devil's system and the devil's crowd and with the planned losers, and by the way, in every gambling situation, you have what's called planned losers. Did you know that? If you didn't have planned losers, you could not have winners. You have to have people that they consider a greater percentage of losing the game than winning. That's how they make their money. But the problem is, is that a loser loses his substance of life. And if you are wanting his substance at, at his risk, you've become an idolater. You are looking at him and eating the flesh of a, of a victim sacrificed to the devil. Now we have the Apostle Paul addressing this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right. Note, if you will, verse number 14. Wherefore, dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. A covetous man who is an idolater. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Two times the words were associated, but not icon, but eidolon. Not the hard and fast substance that's worshipped, but the victim whose substance is seen but devoured. So, flee from idolatry. Why? Because, verse 18, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. Yes, that's true. You're devouring the substance that was offered to devil. 
What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered to sacrifice is anything? No, that's not the point. We know that, that the stone and the victim are nothing. But there is something behind them. The stone represents a demon god, a demon philosophy or power. And the victim represents a, a, a human being or something sacrificed to get blessing or favor. That, of course, is what's done in this. You want the future blessed. But this I say, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. While you're eating the flesh of, the, of these victims, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? You see? Hey, uh, that... That, if there's going to be a victim, that victim belongs to God. If there's going to be substance that, that's given, it, it better be substance that is given in pure devotion to God if you're going to participate at the Lord's table. Now, note verse 24. Let no man seek his own benefit, but every man another's wealth. You see, you see Pastor, there it is. It sanctions gambling there. <laughs> No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that with regard to benefiting from the future, if it comes down to, the push comes to shove here, the bottom line is you must say, no, I, I don't want to be benefited at the expense of another man. If he earned it, he deserved it, he should get it, not me. That's what it's talking about. So this is again with regard to that. Why? For the earth, last, uh, or verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Verse 28, if any man say to you, this is offered in sacrifice to idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, why again? For the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. You don't have to go to the devil's system. God has enough for you in his grace to take care of you. You don't have to eat those victims. God's grace will take care of your needs. That's why he says it twice in this passage. When you're going there, don't eat if it's a victim sacrifice to devils. Why? Because God's got enough for, for you. Yeah, but maybe they won't like me. Doesn't matter. It's better that the world doesn't like you than for God not to like you. It's better for the world not to, uh, to not participate in the world system than to not participate in God's system. It is mammon worship. Mammon literally is wealth personified or deified. Okay, let's move on here. Point two. Titus chapter two. Gambling contradicts three basic principles of Christian living. You're either going to live by grace or by greed. You're either going to have nothing but spiritual capacity and allow God to provide for you, or you're not going to have spiritual capacity and you're going to be grasping for the things of this world. It's either or. There's no in between. There's no, well, I'll just be a little bit greedy here, but live by 75% grace. 50% here, 50% there. All fooey. But when it gets down to it, I'd rather risk all my money in a greedy fashion of a one-shot-for-all deal than to live every second of every day allowing God to provide my needs. Nonsense. It's either grace or greed. When you're greedy, you're not living by grace. And when you're living by grace, you don't need greed. Be content with such things that God provides you. I can take you to several scriptures that tell you that. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Worldly is cosmikos. Cosmos means the world or its system, its order of things. But when you have cosmikos, it means belonging to the secular. It's what Adam wanted. He took of the fruit. Why? Because he saw the world. And that's why Jesus Christ quotes this verse. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? You're taking the greatest gamble of, of all that God's going to not fulfill his word. 
You think you're going to beat God's system? You've got another thing in mind. You cannot desire that which belongs to the secular for the most part. Now, having God meet your secular needs by grace is not wrong. But getting it by way of participating in that which belongs to the secular is, a, is another thing. Epithemia, the boiling point of desire. Now, that's why. Uh, let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We've got just a few moments here. We're going to look at this word, therefore. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye not walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. I've read several books on a Christian perspective versus uh, the, the gambling um, philosophy. And in each of these books is interesting. They said that gambling uh, conjures up fantasy values. Get rich quick schemes, leaving God out of your life, but participating in the world system and having fortune to favor you with, with material wealth. So that, in, a, in effect, you don't need God. That's what this is, verse 17. The vanity of their mind is fantasy values. You make it up as you go. Somehow you're going to control your future without God controlling your life. Your understanding is darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through ignorance. They're not walking in prospect. They're not walking in retrospect. They're walking in reject. I don't care to have the light of God because of the blindness of their heart. Therefore, their, their past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, here is the word greediness. And you've heard a very similar word to this uh, in recent years. Pleonexia. But the opposite, the antonym for this word in the Greek language is anorexia. Yeah, have never heard that before. What is that? Well, that's an inordinate loss of appetite. I don't care to eat. Oh God, give us anorexia. <laughs> it's difficult in today's world in America. Uh, no, I'm teasing. Anorexia nervosa. All right, that means you have this loss of appetite. You just don't care if you have any material goods or substance in your stomach. But note the word he uses. What are they working? Pleonexia. The inordinate gain of appetite to have and hold more. You know, at the Roman orgies, what, um, what they would do is they would feast, and then they would take a little feather, and they would go outside, and they literally had their vomiting areas where you would go, and this is, this is absolutely gross, but it's absolutely true. You would gorge yourself into planexia. I can't hold anymore, but I want to eat more. And so out you go, and you take a little feather, and you disgorge your food and clean yourself up and go right back to the table and you know what you do again? You'd gorge on the food. How many times they could do this, I don't know, but they, they did it and history records it. That's where that word comes in. Now, that is the word that God use, uses relative to the gambling. You want more than you can hold, more than your capacity, more than you're able be, because you want to live at someone else's loss. So, uh, right here, you don't need to go to some psychologist or some food clinic to help you over this. What you need is a good dose of the filling of the Spirit to be content with such things as you have. Now, there's nothing wrong with working hard to gain as long as this is not the motivation for it. All right, we, we have just another minute here. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, we will get the meaning of the word charis. We've gotten it many times before. But we'll give it again here because it's appropriate to our subject. Greed says, I'm full, but uh, I want more. 
I want more. I've got to have more. And I've got to have it at the risk of somebody else. I don't care if they lose. I, I'm going to take their substance and devour their flesh so that I can enjoy it and so that I'll get bigger and fuller and so forth. But the grace of God is so different. Grace means that God has enough to take care of everyone. We don't have to be jealous. We don't have to wish someone else ill uh, in order for us to benefit from God's system. He owns the cattle in a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's why he quoted it twice. You don't need to be jealous at the prosperity of another man if he's gotten it in God's system. You don't have to want that. The earth is the Lord's. He's got enough for you. Grace, chapter 8, 9 rather, verse 8. We live by grace or we're living by greed. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. If you're not living by grace, you're out of the will of God. It's God who makes all things to work together for good to them that love Him. You want to control your future, just put yourself in the direct will of God. And I guarantee you, He will work the things out ahead of you in your life so that, so that you will come out to His glory and your best blessing, your best benefit. That's what Caddis is, a gift or a benefit given by God freely. That's what they used to say in the temple worship. And the Apostle Paul coined this word for Christianity. They would come in there and they would froth at the mouth and they'd say, they've got Caddis, a gift from God, this, this uh, feeling of euphoria and so forth. That's what the tongues crowd does today. But the Apostle Paul says, wait, let me take this and show you. It is a free gift from God. That's what the word actually should be used as. God says you don't earn it, you don't deserve it, but you're trusting me for it, and I'm going to give it to you by my grace. That's how salvation comes, and salvation sets the precedent for the Christian life. We trust Him.